welcome to Cornell. You've come to a unique and life-changing place, a place of limitless opportunity and great diversity, a place where people learn and discover and create and act to lift the world's burdens. In 1961, Charles Dyson brought his son, John, to Cornell University to study what was then known as agricultural economics. Since that time, Charles and his wife, Margaret, and their children, Annie, Rob, Peter, and John, have had a long and rich history with our School of Applied Economics and Management in Cornell University. This legacy will last into perpetuity. This is about generations of kids who can come here now, uh, go to a, a school that'll be able to teach them the things they need to know. Education is, is the only kind of giving I know that has a multiplier effect. It helps not just one generation, it, it fuels the next generation. And it does that not simply by educating, but by the research it generates, expanding the horizons, creating new possibilities where none existed before. And Charles Dyson knew that very well. He was a very entrepreneurial man. He would see opportunities where there were no opportunities. Philanthropy is the edge for excellence that allows some schools like Cornell to dream just a little bit bigger, to reach just a little bit farther. So his, his view was that by, by doing that, you could uh, expand uh, people's horizons uh, for years and years. From his immigrant roots, from my mother's immigrant roots, that it was your, the idea was to give back, to participate actively in this country. I always admired how my grandfather really helped other people. The whole idea of honesty, integrity, hard work. He was a man of principle, man of discipline, man of intellect, and a very strong family man. Everybody loved Charlie Dyson. He's a man of great integrity, very generous, had a heart of gold. And I found him to be a dignified and gracious gentleman who knew how to put me at my ease. He clearly got along exceedingly well with people. He just had a way about him that, that made people comfortable. My father was a carpenter. He was from England and mother was from Northern Ireland. The Irish uh, end of it was the mother had the drive and uh, dad had the good judgment. So I got, got the two of them. Well, I just uh, led the normal life of a kid growing up out there. Uh, at the age of 10, I had heard the kids talk about the golf course where they had uh, can't even earn some money. So I went down there one Saturday. And, I came home with 75 cents, which I thought was all the money in the world. He graduated from high school in 1929, and uh, right after he graduated, uh, the economy, of course, collapsed in the Great Depression. So Dad had to go to work. Indeed, when I went to Cornell, he dropped me off at the dorms when I was a freshman and slapped me on the back, and he said, Well, son, this is terrific. What a great country we have. You get to go to a day school. I had to go to school at night. It wasn't popular to, to go to school at night. That's, that's one thing. It wasn't uh, popular at all. Those who could afford it went to day, and those of us who, who couldn't got our education at night. That's what I did. Even without him saying it, I always knew the importance of hard work. Get a haircut. Make sure your shoes are polished. Show up on time. Be the first one in, in and the last one out. He was an intensely practical man. He was so even. He was, always, to me at least, he was, you know, always so even keeled. While he was a partner at Price Waterhouse, he received a phone call to join a group that was putting together the accounting procedures and the procurement procedures for Lend Lease. The 8th of December, 1941, we declared war. Dad was immediately conscripted as a lieutenant in the Army in the Pentagon. General Carter, who was uh, the senior partner at Haskin and Sells, called me and said, uh, I don't know you, but I know of you. There's a job down in Washington to do. And he said, I think you can do it. 
and he ended up running the, all of the material supply for the Army Air Corps uh, right through the end of the war. He, among four or five other men, set up the whole system. They also set up the system to renegotiate prices to make sure that there wasn't any unfair war profiteering among various defense contractors that were supplying the United States with their needed war materials. He started a, uh, a policy which has carried on to this day. He was a delegate at the Bretton Woods Conference after the war to establish the International Monetary Fund. He was uh, then about 30, <laughs> and uh, looking back on it, he said, you know, we were just a bunch of kids writing this stuff, and we had no idea it would turn out to be as important as it did. As a result, uh, ended up, he ended up being a full colonel and uh, was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. And it was a combination of all of that service that he gave and the effectiveness that he had in leading all of that that enabled him to be bestowed with the second highest honor that the, the country can give any citizen. It was quite, quite an honor. I look back on it, and uh, it was great satisfaction. We were a bunch of 30-year-olds, 29-year-olds uh, who were just uh, taking things in our hands and doing the job. We really weren't aware of how important it would be. You know, his first company, which I, a company by the name of Hubbard Tool, he bought from two sisters. He saw a lot of extra cash. He saw a great balance sheet. He saw good earnings. He saw no debt. Dad knew uh, the head of, of the bank, a very famous uh, banker named Serge Clemenko. Borrowed the entire purchase price from First National Bank of Boston. Four million in for the loan and six hundred thousand dollars of working capital, uh, and he he put up eight thousand dollars of his own money. Three years, however, after they sold the Ford, so they could afford to have, pay the obstetrician bill for me. He was a pioneer in the leverage buyout business. In fact. Maybe the first one. The boldness, I guess is the word I'd use, that Charlie had about taking an idea that he had of borrowing against the assets of a company to get a loan for it and using that as the collateral for the loan. That's what put he and that whole industry on the map. That was his start in 1954. And he went on and just did company after company in that way, all uh, on a friendly basis. It was a um, pretty staggering string of successes. And the failures that did take place were, um, I won't say insignificant, but the failures that did take place were recoverable. Oh, my own business. Um, that kept me fairly busy. And I really did have a lot of balls in the head when I think about it. I just, just got it done, that's all. Somehow, because of his involvement with a couple of organizations that were more bipartisan, uh, the group in Washington, Nixon's staff, thought that they, they, this so-called enemies list, stupid name to put on a list like this. A lot of prominent people. Charlie wasn't the only one. Everybody uh, called from every news media uh, across the, the world, practically. Uh, why would a Republican businessman end up uh, on Nixon's enemies list? I mean, we're talking about David Brinkley and Walter Cronkite and all kinds of people who'd called personally. <laughs> so I, uh, I said, well, what should I say? And he said, just tell them that being on Nixon's enemies list is an endorsement for good standards. I think my mother had a major contribution to my father's success. I don't know from conversations with Charlie years ago whether he could have done it alone if, if uh, he didn't have Margaret sort of, you know, encouraging him on when things didn't go well. She was not only right behind him, she was beside him in every sense of the word. Keeping Charlie in the straight and narrow, uh, being supportive, being um, coaching in the background. The early years when I got into charitable giving, she was always involved with what, what should be the cause and to whom should they give. And uh, very early on, he, he focused on helping kids go to, to college in, in the daytime. I remember having this discussion with my family 
about the generosity and the leadership of the Dyson family that enabled me to go to school. And um, probably because I went to school, my children were able to. And that influenced us, that pay it back attitude influenced us to create the uh, Younger Family Fund for Excellence here at CALS. And uh, we're proud of that, but it was the leadership and the example set by Charles Dyson that I think influenced us to do that. In all parts of the world, you meet AIM alums and they're also proud of you know, their alma mater and they're happy to come back, they're happy to give, and I think I'll be honored to join the ranks one day, so. Cornell is an unusual institution in that it is a private university, but it has very close connections to the state of New York. It is New York's land-grant institution. And as such, it owes special service to the people of New York. And certainly through this program, the Dyson program, we're going to be able to realize that um, because many of these students will go out and offer service to the state and the nation and even to the world. You know, there are more aspects to business than, you know, simply finance or simply, you know, numbers that um, it's about the community. It's about um, giving back. It's about, you know, really understanding what makes, you know, a, a great economy, a great um, set of values. We want them to have a much broader education than just the ability to be successful as business people. We want them to also be good citizens of the world and basically participate in helping to solve uh, many of the problems uh, facing the world today. The Dyson School is not just composed of an undergraduate business program. Um, it is a, a program that has multiple components, including a number of graduate programs associated with it. Our applied research goes on in such different fields as environmental and resource economics, agricultural finance, food security issues, poverty alleviation, agricultural economics domestically and internationally. But everybody is committed to contributing and solving the real world issues right now. So, and that's quite unique about our department. The underlying concept, the motivation, the strong, strong devotion and commitment to not only teach the fundamental and classical arts of inquiry in a university, but to apply the knowledge that results from that inquiry for the greater good in Cornell and the Dyson family, both are great examples of that. It's just an enormous benefit to have such a family associated with this program and the level of ethics and involvement that it represents is immeasurable. This kind of philanthropy will allow us to maintain that edge of excellence, to continue that ripple effect, both across society right now and out into the future. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dyson family. I get very emotional when I think about Charlie. He was a person that gave back. And that's what, that's what I'm going to do. Just follow his example.